Welcome back to the Oscar Project Podcast, the show where I discuss Oscar-nominated films year by year. I'm your host, Jonathan Eacherberg, and today I have an interview with Suzanne Ferris, author of the new book, Lost in Translation, from BFI Film Classics. Fair warning that there may be spoilers for the film Lost in Translation today, in case you've never seen the film. If you missed my previous interviews, be sure to go back and listen, and then subscribe to the Oscar Project in your podcast player so you can get upcoming episodes as soon as they are released. If you like the interview and want to hear more, please consider leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. After 25 years of teaching at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Suzanne Ferris took early retirement and moved to Oregon, where she continues to pursue research and writing. She has published in the areas of chick culture, literature, fashion, and motorcycle studies, with more recent work in film and visual studies. Her first book about Sofia Coppola, The Cinema of Sofia Coppola, Fashion Culture Celebrity, was published in February 2021, and she edited the Bloomsbury Handbook to Sofia Coppola, which was published in early 2023. She joins me today to talk about her latest book, Lost in Translation, from VFI Film Classics, about Coppola's film that celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm honored that you selected me for an interview and that you're focusing on Coppola's film. It's a wonderful book. I truly enjoyed it. And it's obvious that Sofia Coppola's films hold an important place in your life. Can you tell me a bit about the first time you saw one of her films and, and what you connected with? Well, I can tell you that it was her first film, The Virgin Suicides. And the reason why I went to the, the see the film was because I was a big fan of the novel on which it was based by Jeffrey Eugenides. I just adored that book. And then when I saw the film, I thought she had not only done a beautiful adaptation, but I thought that I was seeing a visual aesthetic that really resonated with me um, and her use of very deliberate, slow pacing, some might say, as well as really fantastic, I thought, use of music. Mm -hmm. And so those three elements, I would say, struck me from the start about her films. And I've seen all of them. And prior to writing recently about her, I had also written with a friend, Mallory Young, about Marie Antoinette. So I think that um, I have followed her journey since it started in 1999. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's wonderful. Um, now, I like how you structure this book around travel, since obviously the two main characters are both traveling in Japan and much of the crew itself uh, traveled to make the movie. So was that always the plan for the book when you were writing it or were there other approaches that you considered? Well, before I started writing the book, I read many, many of the BFI film classics books, which are so much fun. And what I learned was that it wasn't really a set format. One of the things I do like is that we provide some sort of insight into the production background. Mm -hmm. And as I was casting about for how to organize, the you know, having the freedom to organize it my own way, I just landed early on on that idea of travel because it seemed to me that it was so central to the film's story and that it would work well as a structuring device. So I'm delighted that you thought so too. Yeah, I, th I thought it worked really well and uh, and really made the, the whole book flow from beginning to end. I, I really enjoyed that approach to it. Um, now you talk in the introduction uh, about the opening and closing scenes, which are pretty iconic. They're very memorable. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about them here and why you think those opening and closing scenes stick with audiences even now 20 years later. Uh, well, to me, that was just like an obvious way to start the book, because I do think that anyone who has seen the film remembers two things about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the very opening scene and the ending. And the opening to me, I, I find it absolutely fascinating, even on repeated viewings, that you are presented with a paradox. You've come to see a motion picture, a moving image, and you are confronted with something that seems for a few seconds to be a still image. Right. And you are, you're in this room, this darkened room, and you see a figure lying on her side from behind and you don't even see her head and how unusual to introduce one of the central characters of the film right. from behind, 
you, you don't see her face, you don't have any idea who she is, and you're already confronted with a mystery. Who is this woman? Where is she? And what is she doing there? Uh, and then you learn later on, if you've done any kind of research, that Coppola alludes to an image, a very famous image by the photorealist painter John Cassare. And she is deliberately, in a way, um, it's an homage to his work, but she's done it in a very different way. He has a series of paintings, photorealist paintings of women shown like this from behind, where the emphasis is on their torso and their seat. Um, and she does it in a more naturalistic way um, along the lines of her own film aesthetic in terms of color and lighting. And so to me, that is just an amazing way to start the film. And you see that initial shot of what we learn is Scarlett Johansson probably napping in her hotel room because she's arrived in Tokyo and she's jet lagged. And then the screen fades to black and you hear the arrival sounds at the Tokyo airport. And then you see the other main character, Bob Harris, dozing against the window of the cab as he arrives. And so she very neatly, with not a single word, knits yeah. those two characters together. We know that they're linked on the basis of this experience of travel, uh, jet lag, um, and Tokyo. And then we see, and the hotel, as we're going to see later on. Uh, so to me, that is just a masterful way of starting the film. Sure. And you... I think about the closing, that's probably as memorable, and I guess for some people, more memorable, because we see, we actually don't remember, I think most people, that there are two times that Scarlett Johansson's character and Bob Harris, Bill Murray's character, say goodbye to each other. They do it once in the hotel, but it's sort of short and they're surrounded by other people. We forget that one. The one we remember is when he's leaving in the limousine, headed to the airport, and spots her in the street and stops to get out. And he calls after her, and the two of them embrace in the street, surrounded by a whole bunch of pedestrians. And as he embraces her, he says something to her. And just like at the opening where we're, we're, it's very paradoxical. He's saying something, but we can't hear what he's saying. And this has confounded viewers for the 20 years since the film came out. There's all kinds of speculation. People have slowed the film down. They've used digital techniques to try to clean up the audio so that they can hear what he says. Um, but to me, I think it's really important that we don't hear what they say at the end. You, we've got a very intimate moment between these two people and who have built up a relationship over the course of the film, and they're about to part. Um, it remains a very intimate moment between the two of them that we don't have access to. And right. to me, that's just phenomenal. And I think that's why we remember. We want to know, but we shouldn't want to know. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes total sense. But I, I have to ask, what what do you think that that Bob actually whispers in Charlotte's ear in that in that sequence? If you had to had to make a guess, <laughs> Jonathan, you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I I really don't because I think that it is a moment between the two of them. I don't even like to speculate right. about what they say. I can tell you that when she was making the film, Coppola initially thought, okay, I'll put in the words later. She didn't exactly know what he was going to say. So that's not even in the script. Right. But then when they were editing it together, I think that she and Sarah Flack agreed that it was better that we don't know. Um, and I think that really does enhance the uh, intimacy of their relationship. And it, it remains in our minds, just like a memory, mm -hmm. just like it does for the characters. We remember that we didn't hear it, but but we have that beautiful visual of the two of them coming together and then separating sure. and going their own ways. Sure. Yep. I, I completely agree. Now, aside from the opening and the closing scenes, which we've already discussed at length, there's a lot of other unique films or unique, unique scenes throughout the film. I'm thinking of the scenes with Bob interacting with the commercial crew and, and Charlotte exploring Japan off on her own. And of course, there's the famous karaoke scene with the two of them together. 
Can you pick some of those or talk about one or two other scenes that really stand out in your mind from the film? Well, I, I like the three that you've selected because I think that, as you say, those are all key moments. One of the things that I like about the scenes with the commercial crew is you get to see Bob Harris on his own and you can see that all of his interactions with Tokyo are defined through his work as a celebrity. And Charlotte's explorations are all on her own and they're out in um, to not only Tokyo, but also Kyoto and environs. And so she's more immersed in the uh, landscape and the outdoors and not defined in that same way. Um, and, the, and of course, the beautiful karaoke scene that highlights Coppola's uh, storied use of music too. But right. to that, I would also add that scene where they first come together, which comes about 30 minutes into the film, the first time we actually see them speak to each other is we wait about 30 minutes and they're at the bar. They're both jet lagged um, and they joke with each other at the bar about their insomnia and share stories about their marriages and themselves. And it's just a beautiful scene of the two of them with the twinkling lights of Tokyo off in the distance. And you see that the witty repartee that reminds me a little bit of the romantic screwball comedies sure. um, where they're joking back and forth. And even though he's older and more experienced, she is really his verbal match and, um, you know, accuses him of going through a midlife crisis and jokes that he's going to buy a Porsche. Um, I think some of those scenes are just th that solidifies the connections that we've been seeing visually up to that point in the film. Sure, and the other that... one that stands out for me is the night that they decide that the, both of them can't sleep again. And she meets him in his room to watch a film. They watch La Dolce Vita with Japanese subtitles. And it's once again, like the ending, it prepares you for the ending, this very intimate moment between the two of them. But we might expect that they're going to come together in some sexual way because of the romantic tension that's been set up in the bar scene and others. But instead, what they do is they finally can fall asleep and they do so together resting on on the top of the bed with just his hand touching her foot and i just think it that's just once again an amazing image of intimacy and fits the story of those two characters while resisting cliches about how you might bring these two characters together. Yeah, it, it certainly kind of dances around that whole cliche notion of of the the two people coming together in a in a romance and eventually a sexual romance, but never quite gets to that point. And I, I think that's that was refreshing for me in seeing the film. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that that's the genius of it and of her of Coppola's other films too is she's well aware of the generic conventions and other kinds of travel films uh, An Affair to Remember, for example, um, uh, and other kinds of romances. But she does it in her own way, um, in ways that surprise you and make it original. And so I would say that that's, you know, one of the really strong scenes in the film is that one. Excellent. Now, Scarlett Johansson, we've talked a bit about, she was obviously on the upswing, upswing early in her career, and it's turned into an enormously successful career. Uh, I think we can argue at this point, Bill Murray is more at the midpoint of his career when they made the film 20 years ago. How would you say Lost in Translation fits into the, each of their legacies on the big screen? Uh, well, I think that's a really good question. I think Scarlett Johansson is a very interesting case because she was so young when she was selected for the film. She hadn't even turned 18. But Coppola saw her in Manny and Lowe when she was much younger and thought that she had the kind of maturity to pull it off. And clearly she did. Yeah. And the film Lost in Translation came out the same year as Girl with a Pearl Earring. And I think together... Those introduced Scarlett Johansson as someone who is definitely a serious actress. And it, you know, she has gone on to do like blockbusters and other films, um, the action franchise films. But I think that the other thing that we've seen her do is really mature, um, continue to mature. And she's played other roles where she's 
um, either in a conflicted marriage or an unhappy, happily married woman or a divorcee. And you could see some of the origin story of that in Lost in Translation. And I think that it also, though, got, gave her, highlighted some of her comic ability. Mm -hmm. And I see that in Wes Anderson's latest film in Asteroid City, where she, in a way, is playing sort of like a deadpan, like you would expect De Bill Murray, um, and has is still playing sort of this disgruntled housewife. Uh, but she's the celebrity character in, in the film. And in an interesting way, I think that then she's maturing and following a, a trajectory along the lines of Bill Murray, which is kind of interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. And and Bill Murray, I agree with you. At that moment, he was mid-career. And the film is great in highlighting an actor who is almost in the same situation. It's, you know, a celebrity playing a celebrity. Right. Um, and he had already shown that he was really a talented serial comic actor in Groundhog Day and Rushmore. Uh, Wes Anderson's film Rushmore was one that Coppola said that really showed her what he could do. And, and she had him in mind from the start for right. Bob Harris. So it was not she didn't think of anyone else to play that role. And, and I think that he has continued in that mix that she found for him in this film, where he can show the depths of his character beneath this veneer of the, you know, like happy-go-lucky com comedy character. And in, in particular in the movies by Wes Anderson, but also in her latest film to date, anyway, On the Rocks. Um, you can see him in the character of Felix, that he's playing a character that in a way is like a grown up Bob Harris, I would say, someone who is matured right. um, and not necessarily in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know you just said that, that uh, you know, she never really considered anyone else for Bob Harris other than Bill Murray. Uh, but if if you had to recast the two leading roles in the film, is there any other actors you might think of that could pull off what Johansson and, and uh, uh, Bill Murray were able to do? Oh, this is such a hard question for me um, because they are so locked in my Perfect. mind yeah. as, as those two characters. Um, and you would have to find, I mean, if you were to do it exactly the same way, then you would have to find two characters, one who would be like a, a recognizable celebrity who could pull off being both comedic and melancholic, and then a younger character with that younger female character with that kind of uh, maturity. Mm -hmm. And so the only people I can think of that might be able to do it would be Bradley Cooper, maybe, okay, and Florence Pugh. I don't know what you think about that. I, I can see that. I can see that. I, I think Florence might be a little old for, for that role, the Scarlett Johansson role at this point, but I think maybe maybe a few years ago that would have worked as a, as a good pairing. I like that. Yeah, see, this is the problem because then it's really hard. And I think maybe yeah. it would have to be somebody unknown. Right. But it's right. also interesting because you could think about redoing it in different ways. Um the musician Sean Mendes actually did a music video where he um, took on Bill Murray's role and uh, Alisa Bo was his co-star. So it's a very short version of Lost right. in Translation, but with the sets and everything, it's it's a really interesting homage. But I don't know if you've seen Celine Song's film Past Lives yet. I have not seen it yet, no. Oh, wow. Well, because I think that there's a lot of allusions to Lost in Translation, but it's interesting because it takes place in New York, New York City, and right. it brings a Korean character to New York City for the first time. And so it's in a way sort of flipping the East-West axis of Lost in Translation. And it's not like there's neat parallels between the, her main characters, um, played by Greta Greta Lee and Teo Yu. But I, I find it, I, I haven't quite figured it out because I just saw the film a few days ago, but I'm thinking that 
there's lots of connections between the two. And she, Celine Song has that same kind of languid pacing and naturalistic lighting. And the characters don't really say much. A lot happens visually. Sure. So for me, there's some really interesting resonances. And it got me thinking about what you could do if you set it somewhere else. Right. Yeah, it's it's definitely one that's on my list. I just haven't had the chance to get to that yet. So you've given me another reason to go see it as, as soon as I can. Well, um, I encourage you to. I, I just I, thought it was terrific. Yes, I certainly will. Now, when you're uh, doing a deep analysis of a film like Lost in Translation and, and planning to write an entire book on just the one film, what sort of preparation goes into that process? Well, I can't tell you how much fun it is, <laughs> how enjoyable the whole process is. As you can imagine, you have to, watch the film several times or, and, you know, like all the way through, but also you watch very, you watch segments over mm-hmm. and over and over again. And I would say that, you know, that you have selected truly a classic film when you can do that, when you can watch it as many times um, as I did while I was writing. So there's a lot of, I would say, rewatching, also reading what other people have had to say about it and then thinking about it. A lot of, thinking about how it works and how it goes together and then repeating that process over and over and over again and um, hoping as as I fervently do that you actually get the film right and do it justice so that um, people like you and other people who read the book who know the films actually learn something or see something new or think about it differently um, that that's one of the the real goals. Sure. And I know you, you had some references listed at the end of the book and you just mentioned you're reading other things that people, other people have written about the movie. Were there any specific uh, articles or books that you used as you were writing the book about Coppola that people should check out if they want to learn more? Well, I would say, uh, and I bet this is a bit of self promotion, but it's not really because it's promoting the work of about 30 other people. But I would encourage people to go to the Bloomsbury Handbook to Sofia Coppola, because that is to date the most comprehensive guide to her work and not only her film work, but also other things that she's done, like commercials and television Mm -hmm. specials. And um, so it's the most comprehensive guide possible. And there's a great chapter in the handbook by Lucy Bolton about Lost in Translation, the film. So, uh, and there are a whole bunch of other essays in the book that touch on dimensions of the film, but all of Coppola's work as well. And there are um, two books that were really helpful to me in the writing process. One by Anna Backman Rogers, um, that is about Coppola's visual politics, and another by Fiona Handyside, which is about the idea of girlhood in her films, particularly her early films. Um, and I would I would seek those out also as companions to the companion. Perfect. I have a couple of questions not specifically related to the book, but before I move on, is there anything else you want to touch on about the book specifically? Well, I would say, especially since we're doing this as a podcast where um, there is, is, are no visual images, is to just a shout out to um, the BFI Film Classics series because they are committed to having as many images as possible. And it was incredibly difficult for me to narrow down the number of images from the film that I was allowed to include, but it was so crucial to me to have, especially for a filmmaker who is such a visual stylist as Coppola is, Mm -hmm. to have visual examples to go along with the text. So I would just encourage listeners to know that there's, in addition to to a few words about the film, there are many, many, many images. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I love about the BFI books is that they do include a lot of those contextual images to help explain and tell what they're talking about. Um, So this might be the hardest question that I ask, but you've obviously watched a lot of films throughout your career. If you had to pick only your top three, what would they be? Oh, this is such a hard question, Jonathan. (laughs) Um, I would say, first of all, that it's always changing. And Mm -hmm. so if you ask me today, 
um, I would say I, I have a great affection for Hitchcock's rear window. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at it on my own, how many times I've taught it, how many times it comes up in conversation. So that's always going to be, I think, on my list. Um, and I am still thinking about Parasite from a few years ago. Oh. I just think that that is a masterful movie and about class, about culture, but the, you know, the vision, the stunning visuals. I just adore that movie. Mm -hmm. so that's another one that I would say I would put in the top. And I feel like I, I would put one of Coppola's. I, I feel like I have to have one of Coppola's and I would put somewhere, even though I've written about Lost in Translation and I really do love Lost in Translation. I think that her most accomplished film to date might be somewhere. Um, so I would, I would sh put a shout out for her if I had to pick only three. Perfect. Those are some, uh, some good options there. Now, this is a fun question on the heels of that. If you could invite any three movie characters to your next dinner party, who would they be and why? Okay. Well, that's a fun question. Um, I am such a fan of the screwball comedies of the thirties and forties. And so I would pick Myrna Loy, um, her character, Nora Charles from The Thin Man, because I think that she is just so lovely and witty and sharp. Um, so I think she'd be she'd be a delightful dining companion. Mm -hmm. And with her, I would put Parker Posey's character, Mary, from Party Girl. I don't know if you've seen that movie. I have not. Oh, this is it's such a fun film. It's about a girl, Parker Posey's character, who stars out as a party girl, but truly wants to be a librarian. Okay. <laughs> so, so you uh, once again, I think that then I, I'm sort of drawn to these very intelligent, but playful and funny uh, sure. characters. And then um, another film that I just is just a favorite of mine for some reason is Silver Linings Playbook the David O. Russell mm -hmm. film and it would be hard for me to pick between Pat Bradley Cooper's character who I think the the two women Nora Charles and Mary would just have such fun with or sure. Tiffany Jennifer Lawrence's character who is a lot like them she's somebody who's right. very you know driven she wants to you know, be a dancer and she has this, her mind on this competition, um, but also really smart. So it would, for me, it would be really a toss up between those two characters. Perfect. Well, we'll let you have four for this dinner party. We'll include both of them. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, do you have any books that you could recommend that you've read recently? It could be uh, fiction, other nonfiction doesn't have to be movie related. Oh, this is a good question. I've, 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 I do a lot of reading uh, for fun and I also mm -hmm. listen to audiobooks. So um, they're, they're not the ones that I'm going to recommend are not like just out, but I would say that they're, they're not that old. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, as I'm sure you have and your listeners have things about the environment and probably the best books that I have read that, make me think about climate change and the future to come are Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future, which is, I guess, a, a it's part of a species of science fiction that is now its own category about climate fiction that's called cli-fi. Um, and it, it's just, I would say, required reading for everyone who's concerned about environmental issues. And Richard Powers' The Overstory is another one that has stayed with me, a very well-structured meditation on the role of trees in particular. Mm -hmm. And the way that he brings separate characters, at the beginning, you think you're reading short stories, and then how he knits them all together, just like the network that links trees, is absolutely mesmerizing. 
So I would recommend that. Interesting. And okay. I think um, because you're interested in movies, and I imagine that your audience is is, is as well, I would shout, put a shout out for Interior Chinatown. Okay, it's by Charles Yu, and it's a really satirical novel about an Asian American actor and how you know he feels as being part of the Hollywood machinery. And it is structured cinematically as well. So it's incredibly inventive. And it was the recommendation of um, a friend of mine, Viet Nguyen, who wrote The Sympathizer, um, a novel that won the Pulitzer Prize and is being made into a series for HBO Max that's directed by Park Chan-wook. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, so, and I would recommend Viet's novel too. And if I, and if I could recommend one more. Sure. Um, I am a, a runner for fun. It's what I like to do for exercise. And there is a great um, mem it's a memoir, but it's also an analysis of the running world by a woman named Lauren Fleshman. And it's called Good for a Girl. And it talks about her own journey as a competitive runner and what the landscape is like, not only for was for her once she became professional, but also when she was a young woman getting into running. Mm -hmm. um, and she touches on promotion through Nike and the training programs. And I thought it was a, really a fascinating read. Excellent. I will be sure to include all of those in the show notes for anyone who's interested. And lastly, uh, before we wrap things up, I know you just finished up this book and it's just out, but what projects do you have lined up next that we can look forward to? Uh, well, I've been thinking about several things. Um, I'm a, a gigantic Wes Anderson fan. And so in the back of my mind, I'm always toying with, with something about him. But for the moment, I'm, I've got my sights set on doing something about hotels and motels in cinema. And I think that it you know came a little bit out of Lost in Translation where you have the Park Hyatt Tokyo. But I'm also thinking about um, motels that are either real or fictional, like the Bates Motel in Psycho or the Grand Budapest Hotel. So I'm trying to end the Hotel in the Shining. So I'm trying to think about other films in which the hotel is like a character, a very significant portion of the film. So that's what I'm toying with now. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll be able to have you back on to talk about that uh, at some point in the future. Oh, I would be delighted. Excellent. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciated getting the chance to speak with you and uh, for you to share your thoughts about Lost in Translation and some other films as well. Well, it was an absolute pleasure, Jonathan. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you again to my guest today, Suzanne Ferris. Her latest book is Lost in Translation from BFI Film Classics, and I'll have a link to where you can pick that up in the show notes, along with links to the movies and books mentioned throughout the interview. Please come back for my next episode where I'll be speaking with Kristen Lopez, author of But Have You Read the Book? Until then, I hope to see you at the movies.